We are the royal family of God assembled together this morning to obey our Lord's command to keep on doing this in remembrance of me. If you will turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 22, verse 14, there we have an account of what happened in the upper room. It's called the Last Supper. Actually, it was the first supper, the first one that where the Passover was uh, observed in a new and different way. You can also look up here if you'd like. Luke chapter 22, verse 14. When the hour had come, he reclined at the table. This is, of course, referring to Jesus Christ. It was in the upper room, the Last Supper. They were going to observe Passover, but not in the usual way. And the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Verse 16, for I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So what Jesus was telling them is that he was going to be gone. He was going to leave after he had fulfilled his mission on earth. And they would have this meal again, but it wouldn't be until all is fulfilled in the kingdom. And of course, we know that there was, uh, there's going to be the rapture. The church age will end, the tribulation will occur, and then the second advent will occur before this happens. Verse 17. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, Take and share it among yourselves. For I say, you will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. So he says this when he took the bread, the two elements that we will partake of today, the unleavened bread, and also the cup. In Luke chapter 22, verses 28 through 30, Jesus just flat out tells them that he is going to have that again and won't have it again in this meal until the kingdom. Verse 19, And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. You may see up here that I have do this is underlined. Uh, that's the Greek word poieo, P-O-I-E-O, and it's in the present active imperative. It means to keep on doing this, and it is a command to do it. And the Bible doesn't say how often to do it, but we are to keep on doing it. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Uh, Before we end and start to partake of the elements, I'm going to comment on that as well. Now I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 through 26. This is in another count. That was Luke, who was there, of course, at the upper room. Now we have an account from the Apostle Paul. Now, one thing you might think strange is, how's he going to comment on something that happened when he wasn't there? Well, he explains that right at the very beginning. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. You see, Jesus Christ took Paul aside and taught him personally, one-on-one, face-to-face. And he's telling him, it is the Lord that told me what I'm going to relate to you now. So he said that uh, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, 
He broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, we have the same Greek word, poeo, present active imperative. And you'll notice the other two uh, verses, or at least sentences, that said that they will not eat this again together until the kingdom comes is not shown here, but we picked that up in, in the Luke passage. Verse 25, In the same way he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. There are a lot of people, probably at least a quarter of the population of the earth, take communion, the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper. These are all synonyms for the same event. But they take it thinking that it's necessary in order to uh, have your sins forgiven. There are some that think that this is actually Christ being sacrificed again over and over. And if you don't partake of the wafer, if you don't partake of the cup, then your sins are not uh, forgiven. That is not biblical. It is not true. The reason that we observe this, not only because we are commanded to do so, but because... We want to do it. We want to remember Jesus Christ in this special way. You see, all of us individually are believers, and when we take a, a, a moment as the elements are being passed out, we're to concentrate on Jesus Christ. We are remembering Him, who He is, and what He has done. Verse 26 for as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I want to make just a couple of points in passing here. You see, we look back in order to remember uh, what we have learned here as, as well as other things that we're going to see uh, in order to be able to Obey the command to keep doing this in remembrance of me, remembering Jesus Christ. And so this helps us to remember what is really important in life. I imagine if we got each one of you aside and we started talking and say, okay, tell me what's going on in your life. What kind of woes and troubles are you going to, are you experiencing? It would take a long time because we all have a lot on our plate, don't we? And yet, we can't be overwhelmed by the details of life and our circumstances. What is really important, the most important event in history was when after Christ went to the cross, or before he went to the cross, was this Lord's Supper, which was a portrayal of what was going to take place the next day. It helps us to focus like a laser what is really important in life. And I'm asking you, what is really important in life? What is the most important thing or event in our life? Well, I've been teaching this in Philippians chapter uh, 1 through 3. Our goal, it was Paul's goal, and if his goal was good enough for him, I think it's good enough for us, was to know the Lord Jesus Christ better and have a stronger relationship with him. That's why we remain on planet earth after we're saved. Because it glorifies the Lord when we focus on him. When we rely on him, when we trust in him, it glorifies him. And when we thank him for all that he has done, he is glorified by that. So that's our goal, is to have a closer relationship with the Lord. And of course we know the way that you do that is through consistent intake of his word. This ritual focuses our attention on what it took in order to provide our so great salvation. And it heightens our gratitude towards God. Unfortunately, we live in a society that is sorely lacking when it comes to being thankful and gratitude. Just as a sad side note, the Passover feast is identified with the Israelites 
and their being freed from bondage of Egypt. That's what happened. And it, that was the Passover. What the Lord was observing and what we are about to observe, to, uh, to observe was also the Passover, but it wasn't killing a lamb and, uh, and then uh, uh, cutting a lamb's throat and the blood comes out in a sacrifice. It wasn't that way at all because Jesus Christ is the sacrifice. When John the Baptist saw him, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the, the sin of the world. See, all the animal sacrifices couldn't take anything away. It just kind of put a lid on it, just covered it, until the true sacrifice, Jesus Christ, the true Lamb of God, came and removed permanently the sin problem. The Lord's Supper is identified with all humanity being freed from the bondage of the bondage and the penalty of sin. So this Passover, what Jesus Christ did when he, the true sacrifice, the only one that was qualified to be the sacrifice, after he had done his job on the cross, taking care of our sin problem, then he died physically. What was in Jesus' mind the night before they were to crucify him? What was he thinking? What would you be thinking? I, 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 I would think that if it was me, I couldn't get my mind off of the next day, the nails going through my hands and through my feet, and the, the excruciating pain. That's probably what I would be thinking about, maybe you as well, but not Jesus Christ. I want you to turn in your Bible to uh, John chapter 17. You see, John chapter 17 is the real Lord's Prayer. The one that people call the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 5 is just Jesus Christ teaching them how to pray. This is our Lord's high priestly prayer the night before he was to be crucified. And I want to draw your attention to John chapter 17 verse 5. Here it is on the board if you'd like to see it here. John chapter 17, a verse, excuse me, yeah, John 17, verse 15. I do not ask you take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. Who is the them? The them is us. The them are those who God the Father gave to God the Son. This is talk, talking about us. And he was talking about earlier that we are not of this world just as he is not of this world, but he didn't want us to take, he didn't want the Father to take us out of the world, but that he would keep us from the evil one. Keep here meaning protect us from the evil one. Then we drop down to John 17, 17, and it says, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Again, we see the word them. Who is the them? It's the one that God gave to the Son. He's talking about believers. So he's talking about us. And then in John 17, 24, it says, Father, I desire that they also, talking about us as well, whom you have given to me, this is referring to believers, be with me where I am so that they may see my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. This, this, this just really blew my mind because this was his last petition of his last prayer that he made before his crucifixion. The last thing Jesus asked, the last thing he desired was that we may be where he was. Just think of this. Here he was going to go and voluntarily give his life for us. And his last petition, the last thing he said in this godly high priestly prayer was about us. And he wants us. He wants me. And he wants you 
to be with Him. What grace. What love. What a Lord. When Jesus ascended into heaven, He would sit at the right hand of the Father in the midst of untold innumerable angels. The whole company of heaven would be there to sing His praises and give glory to Him as He sat down at the right hand of the Father. And He wanted you and He wanted me to be there as well to experience it. Don't we want those that we love to experience the, the great things in our life? Even as a, as a child, I remember, I, I don't remember what grade it was, but um, there was a talent show at, at, at school. I was in elementary school. I was probably in the third grade. I don't know what it was, fourth, whatever. And I was going to pantomime um, Earth Angel. Anybody remember? And there's one part in it where, oh, Earth Angel, Earth Angel. And I was just really getting into it. And I'm so glad that my mother was there. My father was uh, working. And I just poured my soul into it, and I just got up, and I was waiting to get the first prize. I didn't even make the first, the top five. But I was glad my mother was there because I was just giving it all for her, trying to do my best. And I was also glad that she was there to wipe my tears away because I didn't even get in the top five. I mean, that's natural for us, isn't that? But on the huge scale, Think about Jesus Christ loving us enough to think about us before that horrible day and wanting us to be with Him and see the glory of who He is. He wanted us to experience the glories of heaven. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 21 Paul was in prison. He could be executed. And he was explaining to the Corinthians that don't fear death. Death is gain. It's a plus. And then in verse 23, Philippians 1, 23, he said that his desire was to depart and be with the Lord. But it was, it was much better to do that than to stay on planet Earth. Then in verse 24 it said, so that they may see my glory which you have given to me. We don't, we, we haven't seen our Lord's glory. He took a few disciples up on the Mount of Transfiguration and gave them a little peek at what he would look like in his resurrection body. And they described it as trying to look at the sun in its full power. Could even look, it was so glorious. His glory is so amazing and incomprehensible you can't even put it into words to express all that He wants us to experience and that's to see Him as He truly is. You see, He came as a sheep born of a, in a carpenter's house no fanfare, born in the stable. And so that's the way people remember Him. But He wants us to be where He is and see His glory because He's thinking of us. And I can't wait to see Him. I don't know about you. I'm a little scared. <laughs> I'm a little apprehensive about seeing something so wonderful. But I want you to know that before He went to the cross, that is what He was thinking about. He wants us to experience the glory of the light of the eternal city that's found in Revelation 19, 26 through 27. There's so much glory, we, we, we just can't even imagine how wonderful it's going to be. And this is what he was thinking about. When I was still living in Houston and we were driving to Grainvine to build our log home, my daughter used to uh, go with us. And on 529, back then, I know it's a lot different now, but back then, it was just one long, straight road. There was nothing on it except when you got to the end of it where it dead-ended, 
there was a rice dryer there. And they had these big things going up like this. And the first time we went there, uh, as we got closer and closer, my daughter got all excited because she, she thought that was the Emerald City. And I say that because that's kind of how we, we, we can't even... She thought the rice dryer was, you know, at a distance, looked like the Emerald City. Well, that's about how we are in our imagination of how heaven is going to be and the glory there and how glorious Christ is. is. And when we see it, he wants us to think about these things. And I want you to think about that as these elements are passed out and how much he loves you that he was thinking about you before he went to his death. The fact that we are to keep on observing this ritual until he comes focuses our mind on the future. We look back to remember, but we also look forward to the future because of what we learn when we look back towards him. So it's important for us to think about the future. And I'm not talking about what we're going to have to eat today or what you're going to do tomorrow. I'm talking about eternity future. We call it a personal sense of eternal destiny. We should be making decisions in the here and now that will determine what we're going to be when we're in heaven. Heaven is not a, uh, heaven does not give trophies to everyone. There are those who are going to grow to spiritual maturity and they're going to have rewards, decorations, crowns, opportunities that we can't even hardly envision. They're so wonderful. And so that helps us to remember He's coming. He could come today. Some people might think, well, I hope He doesn't come before lunch. <laughs> well, I hope He doesn't come before I get married or whatever it is. Oh, so silly. So we need to think about the future because, listen, eternity is closer than we think. It's right around the corner. Now, one, this last part of this communion service, I want to talk about the, the part of the scriptures that says, the cup is the new covenant in my blood. Now, it's true that Jesus Christ had to die on the cross in order to pay for our sins. And the cup, it didn't have blood in it, but the contents of the cup is referred to as Christ's blood because the blood is indicative of the animal sacrifices that were pointing to him. But it wasn't the blood that was shed on the cross that pays for our so great salvation, which some people oh, that's blasphemy. No, it's a representative analogy of his spiritual death on the cross. Christ's physical death and all the torture that he underwent did not pay for our sins. Because when you go to Genesis uh, chapter uh, 2, and God said, you shall not eat of the tree, of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, because when you do, in that day, you shall surely die. Did Adam and Eve die physically? when they ate of the fruit. No, they died spiritually. And it is the spiritual death on the cross that paid for our so great salvation. It's when the, the, the sky was darkened and Christ started screaming out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He knew why. He was fulfilling prophecy in saying that. But it was the first time ever that He and the Father and the Holy Spirit were separated. The Father and the Holy Spirit were separated from Him while He was taking on our sins on the cross because they could not be identified with sin. But Jesus Christ voluntarily was identified for our sins and took on our punishment as that was taking place. So that's true. But when it says that this is the new covenant in my blood, it's talking about something else. In Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31... I'll show it to you here real quickly. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 33. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. 
This is a covenant that would replace or is going to replace the old Mosaic law. Notice, he will make a, a, a new covenant with who? The house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord, but this is a covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Now we know that this is going to take place. This covenant, this new covenant that will replace the old covenant is going to take place in the millennium. But what Christ is saying, he's saying to his disciples in this, in this uh, ritual, what he's saying to them is that his death is going to ratify the covenant that was promised by Jeremiah in Jeremiah 31. See, a, a, a covenant is somewhat like a, a last will and testament. There has to be a death. You don't receive the uh, a whatever is will to you until a death takes place. And he's telling these disciples, at this time, in my death, not only is it going to take care of the humanity's sin problem, it's also a ratification of what uh, Jeremiah said. And so they understood that to be that. And in the millennium, they're going to sit down again, he is with his disciples, and have uh, the the uh, Passover again. And that is when the new covenant will actually go into effect. Jeremiah promised it. Several places it's promised. Jesus Christ ratified it. Okay, it's now ready to be implemented, but it will not be implemented until the millennium. And it's going to go to the Jews, the, the Israelites. And uh, that's what that means. I just wanted to clarify that. I never have before. I made some of you maybe think, what is this new covenant? What is that talking about? That's what it's talking about. Okay, it is um, a few things before we actually partake of the elements. You don't have to be a member of Country Bible Church to uh, partake of these elements because if you are a believer, a child of God, then you are all, you are fully uh, ready and able to take this communion. Also, the bread speaks of Christ's perfect humanity. He was the only person ever that never committed any sin, not a mental attitude sin, not a verbal sin, and not an overt sin. That is what made him qualify. Yeast, or leaven, is putrefies, it destroys. And that's, that's why this is unleavened, because it's showing Christ's perfect humanity. The cup represents the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross. And as we partake of these elements, it's somewhat of a test. Are we going to be able to really obey this? Each one of us individually remembering Christ, focusing on who he is, what he has done, and what he's going to do for us. There is a warning that if you take the elements in an irreverent way, like they did, the, the Corinthians did, then some of them were, uh, were struck uh, with illness. Some of them even died. So I say that because we're going to have a few moments of silent prayer, and during that time you have the opportunity to name any, con any unconfessed sins, which ensures the filling of the Holy Spirit, and then we will all be ready to partake. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this special time that we, the body of Christ, the church, have the opportunity to remember Jesus Christ in this special way. We pray that you will flood our souls with Christology, the things of Christ as we partake of the bread. We pray this in his name. Amen. It is our custom to retain the bread 
until all have been served. He was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripe, we are healed. The night before our Lord was to be crucified for us, he took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and said, this is my body that is given for you. Take and eat there." Again, <clears throat> Again, Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we thank you for the opportunity, and now I'll focus on the cup. You'll help us, help us have the proper appreciation for what our Lord has done and will do for us. <clears throat> we pray it in His name. Amen. It is our custom to retain the cup until all have been served.
All we like sheep have gone astray, each one to his own way. He, God the Father, laid upon him, God the Son, the iniquity of us all. God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died as a sacrifice and substitute for us. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. On that same occasion, our Lord took the cup and said, This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. We will stand and sing hymn number 258. We'll sing it softly on the third verse and crescendo on the last verse. Let us stand as we sing. Please be seated. I had some PowerPoints of I don't know how many Sundays ago that I thought would be helpful to put on a card for it for you to take and put on your refrigerator, in your purse, in your car, wherever. This isn't as much for unbelievers, it's not for uh, the gospel, it's more for believers, it's more for you, and it's more for me individually. It, it's about three and a half by four inches wide, it has our website on it. This, this side says, uh, don't forget to do your daily dose of doctrine. That's a good place to put it on a refrigerator, if you go to the refrigerator as much as I do. Then underneath that was something that we, that I stole from uh, Rowdy Yates, the, the guy in prison that we've been contacting with. He teaches doctrine in there. Uh, and he calls it the, the, the D4, but I said that on the card it says the four Ds. Remember the four Ds. It is, these are the four Ds. Daily, daily, diligently digestion of doctrine. And then the bottom part says, Spiritually, don't fall into a rut. It's a grave with the ends knocked out. The other side says, 
I guess I better put my natural my uh, uh, specs on. I'm having a hard time. There is no neutral in our spiritual transmission. We are either going forward, growing as we daily take in the word, or we are going backwards, retrogressing back into our old comfortable wheel ruts of human viewpoint and daily being defeated by mental attitude, sins, lust, and the details of life. This is just a reminder. So these are back on the, in the, in the library uh, where I think it's on that table under where the, the books and so forth are. Okay, uh, I would like to ask uh, Ricky Mahoney to come up and say a few words to us today. He is here. We have been praying for him and praying for him and praying for him. Amen. And Melissa, his wife, as well. And so I'd like for him to come up and just kind of give us a, a little, uh, I, I wouldn't call it a report, just talk about anything you wanted to talk about. Uh, and I know it's going to be about the Lord. So come on up. You can hold on to this. No. Hold it, hold it about real, you know, close to you. Just like this. I may not be coordinated. <laughs> okay, is that good by them? Can y'all hear me? Crank it up. Now? Go ahead, give it to Jesus. Now, oh, not that much juice. Okay, it's all yours. Real close. Yes, I'm Ricky Money. Uh, I really appreciate very much uh, the prayer support, the prayer warriors that y'all have been for me. Uh, the Lord has blessed me in many ways. And I, I know the Lord has asked that each and every one of us pray for the brothers in Christ. And, and it's very much, very much appreciated. And I would like to say that as we prepare ourselves and, and life, we never, <clears throat> we never know what our outcome will be, what the day before us will hold. We do know that the grace of God is renewed daily, that each and every day that we face, the Lord is there with us. He'll never leave nor forsake us. And the life of Christ is an example <clears throat> of how we are to try to live as he did. Uh, we'll never succeed, but we can try. We can try with the, all of our heart and soul. And Christ has the humanity. He had the, the feelings and the, the emotions that each and every one of us have. Yet, as the card in the sermon today was he never failed. He never committed the, the sin. He never had mental attitude sin. And we see that. We want to work and strive our best to have that same attitude. We want to show grace in every aspect of the life that we have, the people that we're around. You know, the, the Lord was crucified. He was taken to the cross as our Savior. But yet, those who put him there, those who beat him, those who tortured him. He said, For, Lord, forgive them. For they know not what they've done. <clears throat> they know not what they have done. Can we do that? I mean, that's a, that's a tremendous amount of grace that you could show. And I think that in our lives, we need to strive to show that and try to show grace in every aspect. And I can tell you as a, the testings that I've been through, the Lord has been there for me. But I can assure you that you need the Bible doctrine, the knowledge, all that now. Don't wait till the last minute and say, oh, I'm going to get all that right at now. Mentally, you can't do it. Physically, you can't do it. And you have nothing to fall back on. You need to take it in now. You need to advance and grow and to have a point of reference that is spiritually solid and sound 
the Word of God, the promises, and you can make it. You can you can count on the Lord to ease the pain, to pull you forward, and you can look forward to eternity. We can live eternity now by the promises that He has given us. We can think of no more sorrow, no more pain. We can think of the glorious rewards and cities. Think of the good things that are ahead, not what we have or what we're leaving behind. We're moving on to a much, much greater thing in our future if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the ultimate goal is each and every one understand that Jesus Christ paid the price he was crucified, he was resurrected, and he's sitting at the right hand of the Father waiting on each and every one of us to come up and to glorify him. And we can glorify him here on this earth by how we react and live our daily lives. And I thank you all so much for the, the prayer support and supporting my family and myself. Thank you all. <laughs> you know, I know from time to time it enters into my mind, it might have entered into yours as well. What would we do if we had to go to the doctor for whatever thing, what it might be, and he informs you that you have a terminal illness and you have so long to live? I wonder what I would be thinking along the, those lines. Well, Ricky heard those words. And he has gone through misery and suffering I can't even imagine. And his faithful wife was right there beside him all along the way. And I can't help but say that they have been an inspiration to me. Because they're only doing what we all should do. One day at a time. His prognosis is death. So is ours. But if we have a, a, a calendar date, they say you're going to be maybe this long, it's only the power of God's love and His Word that, keep, that, that keeps us, or, uh, uh, allows us to not let that destroy us. I'm sure there's people in, in that situation that it's a constant video going through their mind. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I'm not even talking about all of the pain and suffering, but being afraid of death. I don't know about you. This is, I, I think this, this world is a beautiful place. God's creation was wonderful. But it, now it is ruled by Satan. And every country that has ever come, up, come, come about has gone to the dark side. I thought it would never happen to ours, but I see it happening. You do too. So the zeal and the relish to stay on this earth kind of has subsided for me. I'm so thankful that the Lord didn't leave it up, up to us to make the decision and when we're going to uh, be promoted to heaven. I don't want that decision. And I'm glad he didn't give it to me. Because I know when he makes that decision, it is the perfect time. Because he knows all. And if, if indeed he kept you here longer than when he has decided to take you home, which is the perfect time, then it wouldn't be good for you and it might hurt others as well. We have a day at a time. And the more time that we spend thinking about His Word, we're thinking about Him. The Word of God is the thinking of Christ, and we need to do our best to think like He thought. And so we're really 
really, I'm just so thankful that uh, Ricky and Melissa came today. And it's not that I'm just, I'm saying they are an insp inspiration to me. I'm not trying to glorify them. They're just put into practice and utilize the grace that God gives to all of us. When I say they inspire me, I'm saying, wow, look what God can do. Even in the most horrible times, we can have joy. That's what the book of Philippians is all about, having joy. I don't want to be led around by a ring in my nose by the circumstances of life, do you? And God has enabled us to rise above that. We have the power to do so if we will just do it. Because you can determine what you're going to focus on. And I'm so thankful that they are part of this church. And there's others just like them here as well. And it's just, uh, we're a small church in number. But we're not a small church in love, are we? So, well, I was going to go into Genesis, but the time is gone. But that's okay, isn't it? Huh? There's going to be a time when there is no time. And that's not far off. There's not going to be any locks on the doors either. Because there ain't going to be any, any robbing or thieving or anything. I'm sure for both Melissa and Ricky and Dot and Pete, what a wonderful testimony they are. The, the, Dot and Pete are Ricky's mom and dad. And if you want to be uplifted, even in the darkest of news that you can get, you'll see them smile. You'll see them applying the doctrine that they have joy. It may be sometimes that there's tears that are running down their face. There may be sadness there, but they're really tears of joy because of our Lord Jesus Christ and how much He loves us and what He's done for us. That's the message for today. And I want to be closer, don't you? And the way to do it is to get your daily dose of doctrine. I hope that goes on a lot of refrigerators. The ladies have gone back now and they are, I think, preparing the drinks. Um, and I hope all of you stay. I put, If you look at the bulletin, I made a special plea for people to stay. Because we miss you when you're not here and we want to have fellowship with you. So I hope that you stay and that we can continue just to uh, relish in the grace that God has given us and fellowship and thank Him for all things. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to close in prayer, but my closing prayer is also going to be the blessing for the meal. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are in awe of who and what You are and Your plan for us. And the Lord Jesus Christ voluntarily gave His life for us, was thinking about us, right before he was going to be crucified. It's hard for us to imagine that we are even mindful, that you are mindful of us, these lowly, sinful, fallen creatures. What tremendous grace. Pray that you will help us to think of things above, not on the things of earth or the details. We have to think to some degree, but let us, let us focus on what's coming next, because it is coming, and it's coming soon, and we hope our Lord is coming soon as well. And we thank you for the fellowship that we will have, for the meal that we are about to partake. We pray that you will sanctify this food to our bodies, for we pray this all in Jesus' most high and holy name. Amen. Put it close. My ears are stopped up. Okay. I, I, <laughs> anyhow, uh, I wanted to make a, a statement also concerning we made our children, as they were growing up, to go to back a church. We had to go three times a week at least. And then when Bob Thiem had the Wednesday night only for teenagers, they had to go. They could have the Thursdays and the Fridays and the Saturdays off. 
But they had to go and hear what Bob Thing was teaching. And he was such a disciplined teacher, they were afraid to disbehave. Because he called you down. And he would say, stand up and tell me what you I just said. And Ricky calls a couple of years ago and said, Dad, Mom, I never really told you how I appreciate and you make us to go. And that was a great honor to hear. And what we were supposed to do as parents is discipline our children to go into the regimentation of the, of the hearing of the word. And in the studying to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word. This is why he can stand this way. It took, but you got to go get it. He said, he emphasized that. But if you don't take it in and start applying it and believe it, you'll sit and go. You, it's like a train sitting on a sidetrack. It just sits there. It don't go forward. And I always like to think, what puts you on the sidetrack is sin. It's us. Uh, we get out of fellowship. You can just choose to stay there, and the train is either on a slope going backwards, or you're not gaining anything. And take what we hear. We've got a faithful pastor here. And we need to get more young people in here to take out. We're the old gray heads in here now. We need to get some way through prayer, get more young people coming here, being equipped to face this cruel world. It's getting mighty brutal out there. And we see the, the Satan is in the uh, last throes of death throes of trying to deceive the nations to be deceived about Christ. And so anybody you can encourage to become and hear a qualified pastor teacher equipped in the original language, get them here and hear Mike teach. <laughs> Ladies, are y'all ready for us? Is that a thumbs up? Okay. We, we just can go over there and... Uh, the line is over here. Mr. Twiggs, you want to go first? Uh, yes. uh,